Y'all are allowed to go up there, by the way. Just throwing that out there.
So I don't sing with the youth band very often because it's, it's not really what God called me to do. He called me to preach. But the first time I heard that song, I started crying because I noticed that you know, these men in need to breathe were singing basically my story. And I'm sure it's for some of you guys as well that we mess up a lot and we question whether or not God can love us because we think we're a screw up. Because we're dealing with different things that we don't really know how to comprehend. And tonight we're kind of going along that same line. We're going to be talking about someone very important in Scripture. But first, before we do that, whether we like to admit it or not, we spend the majority of our lives trying to get other people to like us. So we, we change the way we dress. We change our hairstyle. We change the color of our hair. Sometimes we even say things that are weird because we want to fit in. What are some of the words you guys use now? And sus is one of them, yeah. You know, that, that dude's looking kind of sus, looking suspect. Another one is yeet, as in... Sorry, I wasn't trying to hit you, but... Okay, see, I don't, I don't keep up with it. What about T? Do y'all still say T? Yeah. Fam? Uh, squad. Squad, okay. But there's... When I was a kid, we used words like cool and fly and, dare say it, gangsta. We used that one a little bit. Cuh? We used bruh. And, and in Lancaster, they said bow a lot, which really annoyed me. But... So let me ask you this. So we, we change ourselves. What about dieting? Has anybody ever tried to go on a diet? No. Did we lose pro presenter? Okay, there we go. Um, 
I try to diet, and you know what happens? I do good for a few days, and then after a while, I really want some Cheetos, or I want some cake, or something like that. And so I think to myself, you know, one piece of candy or a few potato chips are not going to mess it up. Next thing you know, I'm like face deep in a box of Oreos. And I just look at my, in the mirror and I'm disgusted with myself. But so instead of, instead of getting back on track, I tend to give up. Because I feel like I'm never going to be able to get to where I want to be because I can't get past these first few days. Do you guys realize that we look at God in the same way? We are so just dependent on whether or not God likes us. You know, if we do something wrong, we feel like God hates us. When we do something good, we feel like God likes us or God loves us more. We do this, especially when we go through these spiritual valleys and these spiritual mountains. You know, everything's going well, so we're like, man, God's right next to us because we're doing everything that we're supposed to do, but as soon as we mess up, we hit that valley, and we're like, man, God hates us. God doesn't want anything to do with us. And so we start feeding into this mindset that our actions are going to dictate how God looks at us, whether God likes us or not. And so some of us, we get to that point to where we fall so far to where we give up and we, we just say, God, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm just going to be rebellious because it's easier. It's too hard to do all this work to get you to like me. Some would describe it like this. I just don't think God likes me. I work really hard to keep his rules, but I struggle with sin. I try really hard to overcome my problems, and I can't. I pray and go to church. For the most part, I'm a really good person. However, I'm so certain that he doesn't like me that I'm starting to not like him very much either. I really believe that some of you in this room are in that category. You're struggling with that. That you do all these things to try to get God to like you, but you're failing at it miserably, and so you're starting to not like God either. So you come out of obligation because your family makes you come. But every other day of the week, you're doing just ridiculous things to draw attention to yourself, to get other people to like you, to fit in, or maybe even to hide some kind of pain that you're going through that you can't talk about. And so you're distracted, and instead of trying to lean on God, you start to hate God and get bitter because you can't do enough to get Him to like you. For many of us, whether our view, or our view whether or not we like God, deeply impacts our faith. Whenever we feel like God likes us, we tend to be here more. Whenever we feel like God hates us, we tend to find excuses not to be here. Tonight, we're going to look at a story in Scripture that has the same kind of setup or the same impact. So we're looking at myth number eight. God doesn't really like me. And we're going to be in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 30. So let's start with the first point. It's the conversation. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 4. I'm going to read through the first 15 verses, and then we're going to dissect it a little bit. And get into it. What this story is about is the woman at the well. Some of you may be very familiar with this story. I'm going to give you just another second and we'll get into it. All right, so I'm reading from the New American Standard, and this is where it starts. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being weary from his journey, was sitting there by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Jesus got tired because he was human. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are no greater than our father Jacob, and you who gave us this well and drank of it, and gave sons and his cattle. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become to him, or come, become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Then the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. So just to kind of summarize, Jesus and his disciples leave Judea and head towards Galilee. Instead of going the normal route, which is around Samaria, they decide to go straight through, or Jesus does. Jesus then sends all the disciples to go get food because it's about lunchtime. Jesus is fully human as much as he's fully God, so he gets hungry. He wants a little nosh. Yeah, that hurt. Jesus sends the disciples away. A Samaritan woman walks up, Jesus asks her for a cup of water, and she is just shocked at the fact that a Jewish man would speak to her. The conversation initially revolves around him you know, asking for water and her trying to figure out what he's talking about. And he's dropping subtle hints to this whole conversation that he's the Messiah, which Jesus is awesome at doing those kind of things. Um, 
She doesn't get it, like most of us. She thinks that he's talking about literal water and even says that he's no greater than Jacob, who's the one that dug the well. Jesus tells her that Jacob's water will leave them thirsty, but his will quench their thirst permanently. So then she asks for the water. So let's pause for just a second. We see several things that are going on here that show us that worldly approval was very big in this society. So first of all, what we see is that Jews hated Samaritans. We've talked about this a little bit before, but the Jews would not even talk to Samaritans during this time. If you remember last week, I was talking about the verse where it said that the Jews, if they were not welcome, they would dust off their feet. And every time they were going to Samaria, as soon as they left, they would dust off their feet, basically saying, God, be done with them. This is the attitude they had towards Samaritans. They hated them with a passion. They saw them as half-breeds. They would look down on them. They would not associate with them. They called them half-breeds in the sense that they were not pure Jews. That they were basically the ones, whenever Israel was exiled out by the Assyrians, some of these men were left in the, normal king, the northern kingdom while Assyrians came in to habitate the land, and they intermarried. And so now these Samaritans are ones that are mixed between Jews and Assyrians, so they're not pure Israelites or pure Jews, and so the Jewish people hated them. They saw them as half-breeds also because they worshipped God at a fake temple. They were not allowed to go to Jerusalem to worship, so they built their own temple at Mount Gerizim to be able to worship God. And so they thought that was a fake temple and they were heretics because they were worshiping God somewhere they were not supposed to be. So they hated him. So Jesus going through Samaria was a big deal. Second, Jesus broke the norms. If you didn't know this already, Jesus kind of bucked every norm that was there. So Jesus talking to Samaritan woman broke two of the social norms that Jews had. First of all, they did not speak to Samaritans, as we discussed before. But also, for a rabbi to speak to a woman in public could have had him condemned. It could have had him shunned by the rest of the rabbis or anyone else in the religious teachings. So for him to even speak to her in the first place could have had him condemned. But considering the type of person that she was, and we'll get to that in a minute, in a minute they called her a sinner. And so, you know, the Pharisees, anytime the Pharisees talked to Jesus and they saw him hanging out with these sinners they would always condemn him and ask him why he was doing that. So this is another one of those instances to where Jesus is going against the social norms and actually talking to someone who was hurting, talking to someone who has been alienated, who has been abandoned. So Jesus was not concerned about what the culture thought of him. Second, we see the conviction. This is where it gets good. Let's look at verses 16 to 26. It says, He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. So she shacked up with a guy after five failed marriages. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say, you people, she's talking about the Jews. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Or basically, I am that Messiah. So let's back up for just a second. The time of her arrival. I mentioned before that she was there around, around noon. Now, the interesting thing about this is that women would go and get water, but they would always go either first thing in the morning or in the evening because it was really hot. And so for a woman to go, they would typically go together or in groups because, you know, people get robbed in that time. And so for a woman to go by herself to get water at lunchtime where it's extremely hot means that she has basically just been exiled by her entire community. She has been looked down by everyone. Everyone has rejected her, and she is basically the scum of society. So she has to go by herself to get this water, risking her life, risking her safety, and no one cares. She's alone. Jesus tells her to go get her husband. She doesn't have one, but obviously Jesus already knew that. So this woman has had five failed marriages. She has tried to find love in men five times and failed every time. And now she's shacked up with someone. She has essentially given up on marriage because she has never been able to figure it out. And so now she's just living with a guy. And Jesus knew it. So he begins to reveal her life to her. He starts telling her, you know, I know this husband, I know that husband, I know what you've been doing, I know what you're doing. It's, just, it's amazing how well Jesus knows us. So imagine the shock on her face whenever he starts telling her every detail of her life and she's like, who are you? 
how do you know so much about me? So then she does the logical thing, and she calls him a prophet. Obviously, you must have some kind of inside knowledge from God if you know all this stuff about me. And so that's whenever Jesus really hones in on it. Then he tells her that temples are not going to matter because they have this conversation about where right worship is. And he says, look, the temples are not going to matter, which, again, is a major deal. For a rabbi, a teacher, for a person who is supposed to be teaching the Jewish faith to say the temple does not matter, he could be killed right there. They could stone him. Because the entire time that Israel has been established as a nation, they have had a temple. And all of their worship worship happens around and in this temple. They do not worship God outside the temple because for them, everything is merely physical. And so Jesus shows a stark difference in what he is going to usher in with the kingdom of God, saying that it's no longer about showing up at the temple. It's no longer about just showing up at the church and just being there. It's about participating. It's about genuinely worshiping, not just on the outside, but with your entire being. And this was a foreign concept to all of them. And again, it would have been considered heresy. There is a reason why the Pharisees hated Jesus' guts and why they killed him. It's because of things like that that he says. And so then he drops the final truth bomb and he says, I'm the Messiah. I'm the guy you've been waiting for. I'm the guy that everyone has been waiting for. So let's look at this. Jesus knows who you are. Hosea 13, 5, it says, I care for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. Listen to the story of this woman's life. We can see that she was definitely in a spiritual wilderness. She didn't know God from anyone else. She didn't know what was going on. She had no desire to seek out God because not only has she given up on God, she had given up on everything else. She has abandoned everything that she knew and just decided she was going to be okay with living this sinful life and just be rejected by society. She was seeking after the love of those men and her whole life revolved around their approval. There are some of you in this room that you seek the approval of men and women and teenagers more than anything else. And you do everything you can to fit in knowing that that's not who you are because you want to be popular. And it's a struggle. And eventually, if you continue going down that road, what's going to happen is you're going to end up just like this woman who has given up on God and given up on everything else. You're going to change yourself so much that when you look in the mirror, you don't even know who you are anymore. And it's going to be a completely different person. So just like this woman, Jesus knows the intimate details about our lives. He knows what we like. He knows what we dislike. He knows our secrets. He knows where we fail, where we struggle. He knows who we're trying to impress. And he knows everything else. This woman was shamed by her own people, but Jesus loved her. The people that were her relatives, her family, her friends, every one of them said, no, get away from me. You're not good enough. No matter how hard she tried until she finally gave up, she was never good enough for them. But then we see Jesus here approaches this woman who has been abandoned by society and says, I'm right here. I will be here for you. The Messiah, the creator, the one who was supposed to reject her according to the Israelites, according to the Jews, the one that's supposed to hate her because she's a sinner, reaches out his arms and he says, I love you. I care about you. The woman was shamed by her own people, but Jesus loved her. He will do the same for you, even if everyone you know turns their back on you. Jesus will still be there. His salvation and His love is available to anyone and all who call on His name. Next, not only does Jesus know who you are, you know who He is. We see in John 4, 26 that Jesus tells the woman that He is the Messiah. This is the first time that He has publicly confessed that He is the Messiah. And He tells it not only to a woman who was looked down upon by their society, but a woman who was a Samaritan who was hated by their society, and also a woman who was an adulterer who's had failed marriages and everything else, a woman who was the scum of a society that they hate. That's who Jesus decided to tell that He was the Messiah. Could you imagine being a Pharisee and hearing that Jesus told the scum of society that he was the Messiah instead of telling them? The ones that have been looking for him and studying the text and studying the scripture and trying to figure out when this Messiah was going to come. That would be a major slap in the face. That he would seek out someone who was abandoned by society to show them that his salvation is here. And not the ones that have been studying their entire life trying to figure out who God is. So let's be honest. All of us know Jesus is one of two things. Either Jesus is a crazy lunatic who made a bunch of claims that never panned out, or Jesus genuinely is the Messiah. And we see through the text of Scripture, through the miracles and the promises and the prophecies that were fulfilled, and we see through natural history that Jesus is the Messiah. There's evidence that supports Jesus being the Messiah in history, not just in Scripture. So he is who he says he is. Next, we see the conversion. That's verses 27 through 30. 
At this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? Again, this was completely frowned upon by their society. That Even the ones that he called to be his disciples were still like, Jesus, what are you doing? What is wrong with you talking to this woman? Do you not know who she is? Do you not know what she's done? And Jesus is talking to her. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. So the disciples come back to the well shocked that he's talking to a Samaritan woman, but nobody would question it. They weren't going to question Jesus. If they genuinely believed in Messiah, they had to trust that he knew what he was doing, even though it was shocking to them. The woman ran off and told everyone about the conversation she had with the Messiah, the confession that came through it, and now the conversion that she had experienced. So what we see is this woman was excited. She was so excited about the fact that she got to meet the Messiah. When the conversation ended, she didn't just gingerly walk and tell people. She ran. She was gone, sprinting, telling everyone she came across that she has met the Messiah. And she says, come and see this man who told everything that I've ever done. That's pretty awesome. Because of her enthusiasm, her excitement, but ultimately because she accepted the fact that God loved her and she didn't have to worry about the approval of men or women or anyone else. She was able to encourage people and influence them to come and hear what the Messiah had to say. She was changed. We see later in verses 39 through 42 that she was truly changed. She was telling everyone in Samaria and everyone that she came across what happened. She was telling everyone that Jesus knew everything about her and all the things that she had done, but the difference now is that she was not ashamed of it. Jesus told her everything about her, but because she was a new creation, because she was changed, all of her previous shame can now be something used for the glory of God because it shows that no matter what she had done, God loved her anyway. And it's the same for each one of you in here. No matter what you have done, God will love you anyway. If you know Him as your Lord and Savior, He loves you. And if you make a mistake, He's not going to hate you. We have to constantly remember, our, remember that because we beat ourselves up all the time because we think that God's love for us is the same as other people's. And so if we make someone on earth mad, they hate us, you know, they block us on social media or they spread rumors about us and talk trash about us. But God's not going to do that. God genuinely loves you. And so she was no longer concerned with being a shameful citizen. She was no longer concerned about her past because she truly was a child of God. Others believe because of her testimony in Jesus' words. So what does this have to do with you? What we have to understand is that every man-made religion in the world has a me focus. It's basically saying, I have to do everything I can to work my way to God. I've got to find these cosmic scales and make sure that when I stand before God, all of my good deeds outweigh the bad. But when we look at Scripture, we see that that is impossible. That there is nothing that we can do on our own that is going to be good no matter how good it looks to the world. Because unless we have the righteousness of Christ, we cannot glorify God. And if we are not glorifying God, we are glorifying ourselves, which means it is no longer a good act, but it is a selfish one. So every other religion in the world is focusing on what I can do to make my way to God, or some of them what I can do to become God. Some of you may be right going down that road. This woman at the well was trying to balance her life on this scale as well. But she eventually failed miserably and gave up. And some of you are doing that and you're going to fail miserably because you're focused on the wrong thing. She was so focused on trying to get God to like her, then that transition to trying to get men to like her and trying to buy their affection and buy their love to her giving up entirely and just living a life that was shameful and alone. Christianity differs from every other religion in the world because it is not about me. It is not about you. It points to someone else. It does not function under the idea that I must do good things for God to like me. We can spend our entire lives trying to do good, but we will never do good enough to escape hell. What God does for us, according to Christianity, is comes to earth, lives a perfect life, dies on a cross for you and for me, is resurrected for you and for me so that we may be able to repent and have a relationship with Christ. It is not about anything that we can do, but what Christ has already done. So we don't have to worry about the fact of whether or not God likes us because he's already showed his love. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done. The woman at the well, she had all these husbands trying to make herself better than she was. 
She was a dirty, rotten, worthless sinner in the eyes of everyone around her, but Jesus went completely out of his way, making a special trip just for her, meeting her at the well. He proved his love for her. He chose her to reveal he was the Messiah and for her to go and tell others about him. The person that said that was Caleb. God used the outcast of society who everyone else rejected to usher in his kingdom. People may not like you, but you are exactly who God can use. I'm going to show you a video clip real quick, and then we'll close out after that. Check this out. This is from the show, The Chosen. But you said that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am He. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. The second was Farzal. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him. Because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. Who is the wrong person? I came to Samaria just to meet you. Do you think it's an accident that I am here in the middle of the day? Are you protected by your hands? I'm not an emotional person, but this is the first time I've watched the scene without actually crying. Because it reminds me of the fact that I thought God hated me. That God didn't want to have anything to do with me, and then he, he reached out to me and he saved me. And I want you guys to know that no matter what you've done, God loves you. Every one of us is like that woman at the well. We've all got a past. We've all got a history that we're ashamed of. And God is saying that even though everyone else has rejected you, I love you. So you don't have to struggle. You don't have to hide the pain that you're feeling. You've got people around you that would love to talk to you and pray with you. But tonight, each one of you are being challenged to see where you fit in all of this. Do you find yourself like the woman at the well before she met Jesus? Are you trying everything you can do just to fit in with the world around you, just so you can feel like you belong? Are you, cha- are you changing things about yourself to feel relevant to the world? Have you given up on being faithful to God because you keep messing up and thinking that he doesn't like you? You also could be the woman going through conviction. Are you at the point that you know you are not going to pound the path that God is leading you, that God is calling you to? Has the Holy Spirit showed you that you need a salvation you just haven't made that decision yet? Or you could be the woman after conversion. You've accepted Christ as your Savior and are overjoyed at His love. So go and tell everyone that you know about what Christ has done for you. I'm going to pray for you. The band is going to come up. I want to challenge you to respond tonight. Even if you don't come up here, find someone to pray with you. I know there's some of you out there that feel like you've made mistakes and you've messed up and you don't know where to turn. But it's Christ. The world is not going to give you the answers that you're seeking. The world is not going to give you that fulfillment of being a person that you think it will. That's only going to come through Christ. No matter how many mistakes you make, no matter how many poor decisions you make because you're trying to hide things or get over pain, It's never going to solve the problem. It may numb you temporarily, but it's not going to fix the issue. Only Christ can do that. Find your identity in Christ, not in anyone else. Let's pray. 
Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for who you are, for the reminder that you love us regardless of what our past is. Lord, that you go out of your way to find us because we're clearly not where you called us to be when we don't know you, but you make that journey through the through our own Samaria, Lord, through the, through the land that many others would not be caught dead in, Lord, because you are seeking us out directly and you have called us by name to know who you are, to know that you are the Messiah, that you are the one that died for us and gives us eternal life, gives us fulfillment, gives us the Holy Spirit and changes us to a child of God. I pray for these students in here tonight and even for our leaders, Lord, that if there's anything that we are dealing with, Lord, that you would free us of that tonight. Lord, that tonight would be a changing point in our lives that those that are lost would get saved because they would finally understand that they cannot satisfy themselves. And they can't seek the approval of other people. But it only comes through you. Lord, for those that are struggling in their faith, I pray that you would renew that tonight. Lord, that you would bring conviction and bring healing in their life. And for those that do know you, Lord, those that have already been converted, I just pray that you would renew this joy in them so that they would go and tell everyone that they see about what you have done for them. Lord, give us the boldest to move. Take away any kind of fear, any kind of assurance. And Lord, just let us worship you and not worry about the approval of anyone else. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.